you tweeted, quote, why does chemistry need a universal programming language, question mark? For all the reasons you can think of, reliability, interoperability, collaboration, remove ambiguity, lower cost, increase safety, open up discovery, molecular customization, and publication of executable chemical code, which is fascinating, by the way, just publish code. And uh, can you maybe elaborate a little bit more about this Chi DL? What does a universal language of chemistry look like? A Cronin complete language. Well, it's a Turing complete language, really. It's um, but um, so what it has, it has a series of operators in it, like add, heat, stir. Um, so there's a bunch of just unit operations, and all it is really is just a. Uh, it's with chemical engineers. When I talked about this, that you've just re you've just you've just rediscovered chemical engineering, and I said, well, yeah, I know. I said, well, that's you know that's trivial. I said, well. Well, not really. Well, yes, it is trivial, and that's why it's good because we've not only have we discovered rediscovered chemical engineering, we've made it implementable on a universal hardware that doesn't cost very much money. And so the KIDL has a series of statements like define the reactor, so it defines the uh, reagents, so they're all labels, so you assign them. And what we I also implemented at the beginning is because I give all the hardware IP address, you put it on a graph. And so what it does is like uh, the graph is equivalent to the, fir the processor firmware, the, the processor code. So when you take your KDL and you go to run it on your computer, you can run it on any compatible hardware in any configuration. It says, what's your, what's your graph look like? As long as I can solve the problem on the graph with these unit operations, you have the resources available, compile chem piles. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, I, I, we could carry on for years uh, but it is really it's compilation and, yeah. and what it now does is it says okay the problem we have before is it was possible to do robotics for chemistry but the robots were really expensive they were unique they, they were vendor locked and what I want to do is to make sure that every chemist in the world can get access to machinery like this at virtually no cost because it makes it safer it makes it more reliable. And then if you go to the literature and you find a molecule that could potentially cure cancer, and let's say the molecule that could potentially cure cancer takes you three years to repeat, and maybe a student finishes their PhD in the time and they never get it back. Um, so it's really hard to, to kind of get all the way to that molecule, and it limits the ability of humanity to build on it. If they just download the code and can execute it, it turns... I would say the electronic laboratory notebook in chemistry is a data cemetery because no one will ever reproduce it. But now the data cemetery is a Jupyter notebook and you can just Put execute a notebook it. And people can play with it. The, yeah. the access to it, Reversion just orders it. of magnitude yeah. is increased. Uh, we'll talk about the, so as with all technologies, I think there's way more exciting possibilities, but there are also terrifying possibilities, and we'll, we'll talk yeah. about all of them. But let me just kind of linger on the machine learning side of this. So you're describing programming, but it's a language. I don't know if you've uh, heard about OpenAI Codex, which is- uh, Yeah, I'm playing with it. Are you playing with <laughs> Of course you are. <laughs> <laughs> you really are, Rick, from Rick and Morty. This is great, okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Except philosophically deep. I mean, he is, I guess, kind of philosophically deep too. So uh, for people who don't know, GPT, GPT-3, it's a language model that can do natural language generation. So you can give it a prompt and it can uh, complete the rest of it. But it turns out that that kind of prompt, it's not just completes the rest of it, it's generating uh, like novel sounding text. And then you can apply that to generation of other kinds of stuff. Uh, so these kinds of uh, transformer-based uh, language models are really good at forming at uh, uh, forming deep representations of a particular space, of, like a medium, like language. So you can then apply it to a specific subset of language, like programming. So you can have it learn the representation of the Python programming language and use it to then generate uh, syntactically and semantically correct uh, programs. So you can start to make progress on one of the hardest problems in computer science, which is program synthesis. How do you write programs that accomplish different tasks? So what uh, 
OpenAI Codex does is it to generate those programs based on a, a prompt of some kind. Usually you can do a natural language prompt. So basically as you do when you program, you write some uh, a comment which serves the basic documentation of the inputs and the outputs and the function of the particular set of code and it's able to generate that. Point being is you can generate programs uh, using machine learning, using neural networks. Those programs operate on the boring old computer. Can you generate programs that operate, there's gotta be a clever version of programs for this, but uh, can you write programs that uh, operate on a computer? Yep, there's actually software out there right now, we can go and do it. Really? So yeah, yeah, it's a heuristic, it's rule-based, but we have what we've done, inspired by Codex, actually, is um, over the summer, I ran a little workshop. Some of my groups got this inspired idea that we should get a load of um, uh, students and ask them to manually collect data to label chemical procedures into KIDL. And um, we have a th called Synth Reader. So, there, so there's a lot, bunch of people doing this right now, but they're doing it without uh, abstraction. And because we have an abstraction that's implementable in the hardware, um, we've developed a, basically a, a chemical analog of codex. What we're using. Uh, when you say, sorry to interrupt, when you say uh, abstraction in the hardware, what do you mean? So right now, a lot of people doing machine learning and reading chemistry and just and saying, oh, you've got all these operations, add, shake, whatever heat. Right, right. But, they, but because they don't have a uniform, um, I mean, there's a couple of groups doing it, uh, competitors actually, and they're good, very good. But um, they can't run that code automatically. It, it, they are losing meaning. And, and, with, and the really important thing that you have to do is generate context. And so what we've learned to do with our abstraction is make sure we can pull the context out of the text. And so can we take a chemical procedure and read it and generate our executable code? Yes. What's the hardest part about that whole pipeline from the initial text, interpreting the initial text of a paper, extracting the meaningful context and the meaningful chemical information to then generating the, the program to then uh, running that program in the hardware? What's, what's the hardest part about that pipeline as we look towards a universal Turing computer? So the, the hardest- Computers. The, har the hardest thing with the, uh, the pipeline is that um, the software, the, the model gets confused between some meanings, right? So if, you know, chemists are very good at inventing words that aren't broken down. So I would, the, the classic word that you would use for boiling something is called reflux. So reflux is, um, you would have a salt, you'd have a solvent in a round bottom flask at reflux, it would be boiling, going up the reflux condenser and coming down. But that term reflux to reflux could be changed, you know, to people often make up words, mm -hmm. <laughs> new words, and the and then the software can fall over. But what we've been able to do is a bit like in Python or any programming language, is identify when things aren't matched. So you present the code and you say, this isn't matched, you may want to think about this. And then the, the user goes and says, oh, I mean reflux, and just ticks a box and mm -hmm. collects it. So what, it, what the codex or the chemex uh, does in this case is it just, it, it suggests the first go, and then the chemist goes in and corrects it. And I really want the chemist to correct it because it's not safe, I believe, for, for to allow AI to just read literature and generate code at this stage. Because now you're having actual, uh, by the way, Chemex, nice, uh, <laughs> nice name. Uh, so you, you are unlike, which is fascinating. It's that we live in a fascinating moment in human history. But yes, you're literally connecting AI to some physical, and like it's building something in the physical realm. Yeah. Especially in the space of chemistry that operates sort of invisibly. Yeah, yeah, I would say that's right. And it's, it's really important to understand those labeling schemes, right? And one of the things I was never, I was always worried about at the beginning that the abstraction was gonna fall over. And the way we did it was just by 
brute force to start with. We just kept reading the literature and saying, is there anything new? Can we add a new rule in? And actually, our KIDL language expand, exploded. There were so many extra things we had to keep adding. And then I realized the primitives still were maintained and I could break them down again. So we get it. it's pretty good. I mean, there are problems. There are problems of, you know, interpreting any big sentence and turning it into an actionable code. And the codex is not without its problems. You can, you can crash it quite easily, right? You can generate nonsense. But boy, it's interesting. I would love to learn to program now using codex, right? Just tr hacking around, right? And I wonder if chemists in the future will learn to do chemistry by just hacking around with the system and writing in different things. Because the key thing that we're doing with the chemistry is that where a lot of mathematical chemistry went wrong is people, and I think uh, Wolfram does this in Mathematica, he assumes that chemistry is a reaction where atom A or molecule A reacts with molecule B to give molecule C. That's not what chemistry is. Mm -hmm. Chemistry is take, take some molecule, take a liquid or a solid, mix it up and heat it, <laughs> and then extract it. So the programming language is actually with respect to the process operations. Mm -hmm. And if you flick in process space, not in chemical graph space, you unlock everything because there's only a finite number of processes you need to do in chemistry. And, that, yeah. and that's reassuring. And so, so we're in the middle of it. It's really exciting. Um, it's not you know, the be all and the end all. And there is, like I say, errors that can creep in. One day we might be able to do it without human interaction. You simulate it and you'll know enough about the simulation that will, it, the, you know, I'm, the lab won't catch fire. <laughs>